Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to be showing you how to create beautiful real-time reactive scenes using animation nodes with Eevee in Blender 2.8. The demos you can see on the screen now were created by making use of the animation nodes add-on, and all of them can be downloaded for free from the link in the description. Just keep in mind that you will need the plugin installed and enabled on your version of Blender to be able to make use of the functionality and get the demos to work. If you don't already know, Animation Nodes is a completely free visual scripting tool created by Blender developer Jax that puts a particular emphasis on motion graphics. For the use of a specialized node graph, you can make use of a wide range of nodes to perform mathematical operations, animate objects and their constituent data, and even create objects programmatically rather than making everything manually. This means that it's great for building procedural animation systems that change in response to various criteria. For example, one of the techniques that I will show you in this video is how to use the proximity of an object to manipulate the surface of a mesh. The creator has been making really significant contributions to Blender. If you're interested, you can go and follow them on their Twitter or YouTube page to keep up to date with developments. So let's take a look at how to get animation nodes set up and running with Blender 2.8. First of all, you'll need to go to the GitHub page and grab yourself a copy of the zip file. Once that's done, you can open your copy of Blender 2.8 and then go into Edit, then Preferences. Then you'll need to go to the Add-ons tab and click on the Install button. That will open a file explorer where you can navigate to where you downloaded the zip file. Once you've installed it, you should be able to find animation nodes in the add-on list. To enable it, you need to click on the check mark to the left. If it's installed properly, then you won't have any errors pop up. Then what you need to do is click on the Save Preferences button and then close the window. And now we should be able to start making use of animation nodes. What the add-on does is provide us with a specialized window that acts much in the same way as the shader editor or compositor window. It's appropriately named Animation Nodes, and if we click on it, then it will open a very familiar interface that is identical to any other node-based interface in Blender. This window is where we can create nodes to build up the logic in our scene. What I'm going to do now is show you the step-by-step -step procedure for creating the effect shown in this first demo. But remember, if you'd rather not set all of it up by yourself, then you can download all of the demos from the link in the description for free. Before we start, I'm just going to make sure that on my interface we can see the 3D view, the animation nodes graph, and the timeline all at once, because it will be important to see all of these at the same time later on in the video. First of all, we need to create a plane with a sufficiently high amount of geometry. This is because to achieve this wavy low poly effect, we're going to be displacing vertices on the surface based on their distance to another object. I'll create a plane and scale it up to something like 8, and then I'll press Ctrl plus A and then choose Scale to normalize the values. Then I'll give the plane a subdivision surface modifier, set the mode to simple, and then click the view field and change the number to 7. Note that by clicking on the side of the view field to increase the level of subdivisions, we'll only let you go up to a value of 6, and the reason for that is to act as a soft cap, to prevent you from accidentally scrubbing the value too high and crashing the program. But if you click on the field and enter the value manually, then you can make it higher. Once we've got that, I'll click apply. Now that we've got our plane, we're basically going to go and tell animation nodes that this object exists. The way that we're going to do this first of all is by clicking on the new button at the top to create a new node tree. Then I'm going to press Shift plus A to bring up the node selection menu, then by going to Mesh and then choosing Mesh Input. Once we've got that placed down, if we go and make sure that we've got our plane selected in the 3D viewport, we can click on the pipette icon to the right of the object field on the node and this will automatically assign the plane as the reference object. So what this means is that we can now read the mesh data from our plane object and then use it to create a new one. The way we'll do this is by taking the data from the outputs of this mesh node, using a bunch of operations to turn that data into something interesting, and then bringing all of that data together to create a new object that will change and morph its shape over time. To show the created object on the screen, what we'll need to do is create a mesh output node. We can do this by pressing Shift plus A, going to Mesh, and then clicking on Object Output. I'm going to go to the outliner and hide the original plane entirely by deselecting all of the icons next to its name. The reason I'm doing this is so that we will be able to see our newly created object without the original reference mesh getting in the way. To create a new object output, we need to click on the plus button to the right of the object field. What we can do now is drag the blue mesh data from our reference mesh and use it to create the output mesh. A new copy of the object will appear. So what we can do from this point on is use other nodes to manipulate this line of mesh data to turn the new object into something more interesting. We will also need to make use of the vertex locations output since it's the vertices that we are going to be moving around. So what I'm going to do now is press Shift plus A and then search for the vector wiggle node. You may see two different search functions but it's the second one that you want to use to look for animation nodes content. I'll place the node down keeping it out of the way of our original line. 
What the vector wiggle node does is it takes vector data and smoothly shifts its position. If you don't know, a vector is essentially a container of values. In the context of 3D work, the location of an object would be a prime example of a vector containing x, y, and z values. Just like the object as a whole, each individual vertex that makes up the object also has a list of values that describes its position in 3D space. Now to tell this node that I want it to wiggle more than one vertex, I'm going to click on the button to the right of node seed called create list. This will create a new value called count, and in count we will tell the node how many vertices we want it to wiggle around. In our case we would like it to be all of them, so what we do to get the correct number is create a new node called get list length. Again go to shift plus A and then search for the node. Then I'll drag the vertex locations output to the list input, and then drag the length output to the count input on the wiggle node. Now if I want to make sure the changes we are creating are going to be displayed on the mesh, then I need to reconstruct it with our new data. So what I'm going to do is create a combined mesh node and then plug the mesh output into the mesh input. The object will disappear temporarily while we are setting this up. So to create the complete mesh, we need to provide all of the relevant data listed here. Vertex locations, edge indices, and polygon indices. The vertex locations are what we are changing with the vertex wiggle node, so let's provide that first. We will need to create two nodes, an offset vertices node and a mesh info node. We plug the vectors output of the vector wiggle node into the offset input of the offset node. Then we plug the original mesh output into the mesh input of the offset node. Then we plug the mesh output of the offset into the mesh input of the info node. So what's happening here is that we're using the wiggle node to create vectors that we will use to offset the positions of the original vertices. If I connect the vertices output of the info node into the vertex locations input, then we can pass the new vertex data onwards. You can see that in doing so, a sort of cloud of points has appeared in the 3D viewport. Since we haven't provided the edge or polygon information, Animation Nodes is trying to show us where the vertex data exists in 3D space. This is probably terrible for YouTube compression, so I'm just going to hide that window a bit. Of course, now we just need to provide the extra data, which we can grab from the original mesh. If I create another mesh info node and plug the original mesh data into it, then I can take both the edge indices and the polygon indices and plug them into our combined mesh node. This will complete the data set for our mesh and make it appear properly in the 3D view. As you can see, it's kind of all over the place, but that's because we haven't adjusted the values yet. Although you can start to see how easy it is to start building up some really cool looking effects. If I go back to the vector wiggle node, we can reduce the amplitude to something more manageable. I'm going to make the X and Y values 0.1 and the Z value 0.5. One important thing to know here is that if you're in the solid viewport mode, then the changes we make to those values will happen in real time. But if you are in the EV rendered mode, then they will only happen while the timeline is playing. In the T menu on the left of the Animation Nodes window, which you can get to by pressing T, you can choose when you want the changes to execute. By default, the mode is on Always. You can set it to change only when the frame has switched if you need to, but we won't need to worry about that for this tutorial. Moving on, how can we get these vertices to move and shift position by themselves? Well, if you take a look at the Evolution value on the Wiggle node, you can click and drag it from side to side and watch as the vertices change position smoothly. So all that we need to do is find a way to automate this value. One essential feature of animation nodes is that it gives us easy access to a measurement of time by allowing us to read the frame number from the timeline. What we can do is go to Shift plus A, Animation, and then choose Time Info. Then if we plug the frame output into Evolution and then press play on the timeline, you'll start to see the vertices move by themselves. So what we've essentially done is built a little script inside of Blender using nodes. This type of content design might be a bit daunting for people who are new to Blender because it's a much more programmatical way of creating content than, say, using material nodes, because with materials everything is a lot more visually responsive. But I would say if you think this is off-putting, then try and think about it like a video game. Imagine a logistics game like Factorio or Satisfactory, where you build machines to create new things. In our case, the mesh data is like our raw resources, and the nodes we place down are like our processing machines and refineries. They will take those raw resources and turn them into something else, and in the end we can create new products that are much more interesting than the original resources. So now that we've got this cool looking setup, let's see how we can take it a step further by creating some proximity effects. And what I mean by that is how we can make the vertices only shift their position when they are close to another object. This is actually remarkably simple to do, since we only need to create two more nodes and a control object to get it working. What we'll do is create an empty object in the 3D scene and raise it somewhere above the plane. 
Then in the node graph, I'm going to create two new nodes, an object transforms input node and a point distance falloff node. With the empty object selected in the 3D view, I'll click on the pipette icon by the object input to make it the reference object. Then I'll plug the location output into the origin input of the point distance node. What's happening here is that we're telling the node graph to take a look at the empty object we've just created. We're giving the information about its location to the point distance node, which is creating a falloff distance from the origin. You can think of this like a sphere of influence around the object, which is stronger at the center and gets progressively weaker as you get further away. Now all we need to do is simply plug that created falloff into the falloff input of the offset vertices node, and just like magic, the plane is now behaving in a reactive way, based on the location of the empty object. As we move the empty around, you can see how the vertices are reaching higher the closer they are to the object. You can change the strength of the falloff by going back to the point distance node and increasing or decreasing the value. Now if I play the timeline, we can see both of our created effects working at the same time. We have the vector wiggle making the vertices morph position over time, and the point distance making sure that there is a greater influence of the vertices that are closest to the empty object. You can also change the amplitude values in the vector wiggle node to change the strength of the influence on the vertices. Of course, you don't have to use an empty as a reference object. You can use the location of any object to create this falloff effect. Imagine a drone flying over some sci-fi terrain and making the surface glitch out as it passes. But what we've got here doesn't quite look like the first demo yet, so I'll show you what little changes we can make to get it there. Firstly, the amplitude of the wiggle node was set to 0.2, 1.8 and 0.2. This was to really stretch out the vertices along one axis, low to the horizon of the plane. Then I moved the camera to a position where most of the effect could be seen, although we would still be able to see a slightly lesser effect at the furthest point due to the falloff effect. And then to get some satisfying colors, I used three point lights, an orange, a blue, and a pink light. The orange and blue were just out of frame by the upper corners, whereas the pink was slightly behind and to the right of the camera. Depending on the way that the faces are pointing as they move, they will reflect different colors. I also gave the world a principled volume shader and set the density to 0.7 with a black color. So now that we've taken a look at how to achieve one of the demo scenes, we're just going to talk a bit about how to render the scenes as animations. At the moment, there seems to be a bug where if you're using animation nodes and you go to Render and choose Render Animation, then Blender will crash. Different people may get different results with this, but the bug is a known issue and there is a way to get around it. A solution to this was presented by Video Bombala on the GitHub Issues thread. It turns out that you can avoid the crash by bypassing the traditional interface and using a script to initiate the render. This is fairly simple to do, as you can run scripts from directly inside of Blender. If you really don't want to touch scripting, then don't worry. All of the demo files that I've provided in the resources will have this script included, but we'll briefly go over it just to see how it works. What you need to do is open the text editor window and then press new and copy paste the script from the GitHub page to the Blender text editor. On the line with the bit that says range one comma 100, this is where we will tell Blender the range of the frames we want to render. The first value clearly being the start and the second value being the end. Then, on the line with render.filePath, this is where you will put the path that you want to output the rendered frames to. Just remember to use forward slashes for the directory changes. To run the script, go to text, then run script. Ok, so now that we've taken a look at how to set up animation nodes and use it to create one of the demonstration demos, I'll just quickly show you what else is included in the free resources available to download in the description. There are three demos in total. The first one we've already taken a look at, the second one is more of a bright and vibrant synth wave scene, and the third is a darker tunnel with a rotating light source. The second and third demos make use of rotating elements, and you can take a look at the node graphs in each of these files to see how they were done. So we're coming up to the end of the video now. If this video has inspired you to learn more about animation nodes, then there are a collection of places where you can go to learn more cool techniques. On the Animation Nodes documentation site, there's a list of different content creators that have done work with the add-on. I recommend taking a look at Chris Prenninger. They've done quite a few videos and there's some really cool ones about building audio reactive systems. I'll leave appropriate links down in the description. I also want to give a massive thank you to everyone for your generous donations, it's very much appreciated. Remember to tag me in anything you make so I can see all of your cool artwork. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe and ring the notification bell. You can follow me on social media and join our Discord server to take part in discussions, share your work and get sneak previews on upcoming content. So thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.